So Shannon, I'll actually get started if you're ready. All right. Sounds good. Hey everyone. Um, good to see a number of people here for this talk. I know many people are trying to um, uh, <laughs> trying not to maybe spend so much time looking at election results, uh, refreshing their screens, trying to find out if any there's any news. So I do appreciate people pulling themselves away from that um, for this talk. Um, real quickly, um, in terms of the uh, practical components of the, the Zoom um, presentation, uh, we do ask that people mute themselves during the presentation and um, also be aware that uh, if you do have questions either during the talk or afterwards, um, you, can, um, you can put those questions uh, in the chat and we will try to our best to get through uh, through all of them. Also, after uh, Shannon's talk, there will be about a 15 minute um, question and answer discussion um, session. So you'll have the opportunity to actually ask your questions um, by unmuting yourselves as well. One thing that I will say for this one, um, for this talk, and for moving forward, um, I, I would encourage people just to, um, uh, to turn their video on during the talk. We, uh, I think many people just um, turn their video off, and, and I certainly can understand that. I, I will say from uh, having done a few of these talks with, uh, via Zoom and, um, and getting feedback from others, it's kind of nice to actually see a face, a live human face, uh, when you're doing your presentation. So um, if people could do that, that, is, um, that would be appreciated. So that's encouraged. Thank you for that. Um, okay. Um, oh, one more announcement before I, do, um, before I go to introductions. Wow, I've never had so many people listen to me. Um, at one time. Um, one more introduction. We, we did have uh, an additional seminar scheduled for two weeks from now. Um, we've had a, a change in the schedule. And so this actually will be our last uh, seminar for uh, the semester. Um, we are scheduling for, for next semester. Um, and so we'll be letting you know uh, what that uh, itinerary or that setup looks like um, as soon as we have it finalized. Okay, so for our last talk of the semester, Shannon Kelly is going to be talking about her work um, on, uh, on, on sensory motor and, and neurocognitive uh, issues in individuals with autism. It's a series of studies that Shannon has been working on um, within our lab for the past few years. For people that don't know Shannon, she's a fourth year graduate student in our clinical child psychology doctoral program. Uh, she's been a fantastic student over the past several years. She also was a research coordinator in the lab before she started graduate school. So she's the true veteran of the lab and has been productive throughout her time here. Um, so she's going to talk to you about some of the studies she's done, both um, in terms of um, family studies, as well as studies of individuals with autism. Um, and I'll turn it over to you, Shannon. Thanks, Matt. All right, um, so yeah, well, uh, like Matt said, I'm gonna be talking about different sensory motor and uh, neurocognitive mechanisms of autism spectrum disorder. Um, all right, so um, as many of you know, autism is a highly uh, heritable disorder. So um, estimates say that about 83% of autism risk is heritable. However, this heritability is really not that well understood. And this is in part due to um, the high level of heterogeneity um, involved in the disorder. So um, this diversity really um, is both at the level of uh, individual genes that are involved in the disorder, as well as at the level of phenotypes. Um, and when I'm talking about phenotypes here, I'm specifically talking about uh, characteristics or symptoms that are um, observable. Um, so for example, something that a clinician would be able to observe. And so when we're talking about autism, um, we're really thinking here about some of the core symptoms of autism. So social communication symptoms, um, restricted and repetitive behaviors. Um, and so individuals show um, a great deal of uh, variability here in their phenotypic profiles, so which um, symptoms they present with. Um, however, we include all of these different uh, phenotypic, phenotypic profiles under uh, an umbrella of a single syndrome or disorder. So in our case, talking about autism spectrum disorder. 
Um, and of course, this uh, becomes even more complicated when we start thinking about the relationships between genes and phenotypes. Um, so many um, genetic profiles will lead to similar phenotypic profiles. Um, and then the reverse is also true with the same genes being able to contribute to many different phenotypes. Um, so obviously this leads to a very complex picture um, that doesn't really do a great job of explaining um, the causality of autism um, simply based on genes. So our goal um, partly today and in general in our research is um, to, sorry, to help explain some of this variability um, in between genes and phenotypes. So, um, so kind of getting at what I have marked in this question box here um, and explaining some of the intermediate steps here. So um, this is where the idea of endophenotypes comes into play. So an endophenotype is a measurable characteristic that links genes and phenotypes. So, um, so here we're really talking about um, things that can vary from the level of the cell um, or a biochemical um, difference all the way to the level of specific behaviors. Um, however, these are more specific phenomena than um, at the level of phenotypes. So we're looking at um, more specific quantifiable um, characteristics that we can measure that are, are easier for us to, to measure and, and quantify compared to these really complex uh, clinical symptoms that we see at the level of phenotype. Um, and then these more specific endophenotypes, we also expect to be produced by or related to a smaller number of genes. So, um, so this is uh, hopefully going to, so looking at endophenotypes can hopefully give us a better idea um, of uh, this um, kind of complex relationship between genes and phenotypes by helping us parse it apart so that we can explain the overall heritability of really complex psychiatric disorders like autism. All right, so today I'm gonna to be talking about sensory motor and cognitive impairments. Um, as potential endophenotypes for us, again, to better understand this complex heritability uh, within autism. So these um, types of impairments, um, I will argue, may provide early identifiable endophenotypes. So like I mentioned before, um, some, of the, some of these endophenotypes and specifically the sensory motor and cognitive impairments that we're able to examine um, are highly quantifiable with the tests that we'll be using. Um, and the neurophysiology is very well understood. So um, especially, uh, for example, in some of the sensory motor tasks that I'll be talking about, um, these have been performed also um, in single cell recording studies in monkeys, as well as in neuroimaging studies in humans that have really defined the neurophysiology um, that's involved in performing some of these behaviors. Um, some of these impairments are also closely related to core symptoms of autism. So again, this is an indication that we're really able to connect um, or explain some of that heritability and how it really relates to those um, phenotypes or the clinical symptoms of autism. And then furthermore, um, these can be, many of these can be measured in infants. So especially some of the sensory motor tests I'll be talking about today, have been used in infant sibling studies um, and identifying some of these um, endophenotypes early on um, can be really important so that we can identify um, heritable differences that may um, indicate that an individual may benefit from early or preventative intervention um, before waiting for those later developing um, symptoms of autism before we intervene. All right, so I'll be starting out talking about some of the sensory motor um, research that we've done. And specifically, I'll be focusing on ocular motor control. So ocular motor control is um, the examining how individuals use sensory information and specifically we'll be focusing on using visual information in order to make eye movements. Um, so these um, eye movements can be the cods, which are very fast moving eye movements that 
start and end in fixation. Um, and then also um, we can look at visual pursuit, which is um, a smooth moving eye movement that follows a target. So here are um, a few different tasks that, um, that I'll be describing some results for today. So the first task is the visually guided saccade task. And um, in this task, participants start out by fixating at the center of the screen and then a target, and in our task, these are always a white circle, um, appears to either the left or the right of center. And um, the participant is tasked with just looking at the target as quickly as possible. Um, so in this task, we're really looking at um, how individuals make reactive saccades. Um, so we're interested in the accuracy and also some specific saccade dynamics. So the duration of their saccades, how long it takes them to make that saccade, and also how quickly their saccades, how fast their saccades are. So looking at the velocity as well. Um, next, we have a predictive saccade task. So in this task, participants start out by fixating at the center of the screen, um, and then a white target appears, and this target then shifts um, from the left to the right and back again um, in a very reliable pattern. So um, in our task, after every one and a half seconds, the target moves back to the other um, location. Um, and so this task allows us to examine procedural learning. Um, so as opposed to, um, you know, explicit or declarative learning, um, this is examining um, how individuals are able to um, pick up on these um, kind of implicit, implicit uh, movements in order to learn these patterns. And procedural learning is very important in a lot of different areas, so social, linguistic, and motor behaviors, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and specifically in this task, we measure the degree to which participants learn this pattern or their procedural learning <clears throat> by examining how quickly their uh, reaction time um, decreases across trials. So as participants learn this pattern of how the targets go back and forth and back and forth, um, their re latency or reaction times decrease um, because they're expecting that that, that that next target is going to show up. So they can look at it before, um, before just reacting to it actually appearing. Um, and then our last task is a smooth pursuit task. And in this task, participants start out by fixating at the center of the screen. And then the target moves from the center of the screen um, out um, horizontally. And um, participants are tasked with following this target with their eyes. Um, so here we're interested in looking at the accuracy of eye velocity compared to the target velocity. So um, that gives us a measure of how accurate, how closely participants are following that target with their eyes. Okay, so um, like I mentioned before, this, these types of tasks um, are, uh, we understand the neurocircuitry involved in these tasks very well. Um, and each of these tasks are targeting um, slightly different areas um, involved in ocular motor control generally. So um, I like this image because it gives kind of an overview of some of the major areas that are involved in ocular motor control. Um, but specifically, um, each of these tasks look at um, uh, kind of target uh, specific areas within this overall circuit. So um, in the visually guided saccade task, where we're looking at those rapid reactive sensory movements or um, sensory behaviors toward um, a target, um, these are uh, really controlled by cerebellar brain, uh, brain stem circuits. So looking at the cerebellum and then also areas of the brain stem um, are really being targeted in that visually guided saccade task. And then the uh, striatum and cerebellum are very involved in the timing of responses. Um, so here indicated by the caudate nucleus, um, as, well as, certain, as well as the cerebellum um, are highly involved in um, in 
uh, learning that timing of responses. So that's something that we're really targeting in the predictive saccade task. And then we're also able to look at um, how individuals use um, feedback processes. So how they're able to um, use information, visual information about how well their eyes are tracking a target in order to make small adjustments and become more precise. And these feedback processes are very important in that smooth pursuit task. Um, and this um, is highly involves uh, the cerebellum as well as some of these um, higher levels of cortex. So the frontal eye field as well as the uh, parietal eye field. All right, so um, previously we have found um, that individuals with autism as well as their first degree family members, so specifically um, looking at um, parents and siblings are showing impairments across multiple different ocular motor tasks. So starting out with um, the visually guided saccade task, we see that comparing autism, uh, individuals with autism to controls um, the individuals with autism show uh, reduced saccade accuracy, and in this graph, this is really showing an increase in error. So when they're making a reactive saccade toward a target, participants are showing increased error, so they're making less accurate saccades. And then similarly, um, we found this to be the case in family members of individuals with autism compared to um, controls as well. So um, this graph is actually showing that um, individuals with, or sorry, family members of individuals with autism um, tend to undershoot their target. So they tend to um, also be less accurate but this was specifically finding that um, individual, these family members were, um, were, had greater error in that they were not going all the way to the target, they were undershooting. And then looking at, active, um, looking at performance during the smooth pursuit task, we see that individuals with autism are showing reduced pursuit gain which is that measure of comparing their eye velocity to the velocity of the moving target. So a reduced pursuit gain here means that participants are not keeping up with the target um, and their um, eye movements are therefore not as accurate. So, um, so previously we found that individuals with autism have reduced pursuit gain in this task across a variety of um, velocities. And then similarly in first degree family members, we see a similar pattern where family members again are showing reduced pursuit gain across a variety of tasks. So overall here we're seeing that some of these really basic um, motor, sensory motor behaviors are impaired in individuals with autism as well as in their first degree family members. However, in these earlier studies, um, family members and individuals with autism were studied separately. So um, the ne next step for us was to um, examine how um, these behaviors really are related within families of individuals with autism. So the next study um, that this is uh, a study that we're currently working on, um, or, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm currently uh, writing up some of these results um, from a family study um, along with Aaron Bojanic, um, another grad student in our lab. Um, and uh, here we had uh, individuals with autism as well as uh, their parents included in the study. And we had uh, 44 individuals with autism and then 27 controls that were age matched to the individuals with autism. We had 105 of their biological unaffected parents, as well as 46 controls that were age matched to their parents. And in this sample, we had um, a total of 32 complete family trios. So 32 families where we had data on the child with autism 
and then also the biological mother and father. So this study really allows us to examine the familiality of these ocular motor impairments um, within families of, um, with an individual with autism. And familiarity here is uh, the degree to which performance is intercorrelated amongst family members. And um, while this isn't a direct measure of heritability, it certainly implicates heritability of um, these behaviors, especially because sensory motor behaviors are really unlikely to be um, related to learned responses um, that come from sharing an environment with their family members. So here are some of the results from um, those ocular motor tasks. So looking at the visually guided saccade task, which again is when individuals go from fixation to um, looking at a target that appears in the periphery. Um, so again, looking at those reactive saccades toward a target. Um, here, what we found was that individuals with autism compared to typically developing controls were showing reduced um, accuracy here indicated as increased error in their saccades. So um, their, their reactive saccades were, um, had more error, they were less accurate compared to controls. Um, and this difference was really only found at targets that were 24 degrees away from center. So these are the um, targets that are farther from center and therefore when participants are making larger saccades. So, um, so when participants are making larger saccades, those individuals with autism are less accurate. And then we found a similar story in their parents. So um, parents of individuals with autism also had greater error in their reactive saccades um, when they were looking to 24 degree targets. Um, and then looking at some of the dynamics of their saccades during the visually guided saccade task, um, individuals with autism and their parents, again, were showing a very similar story. So individuals with autism were show showing reduced duration of their saccades. Um, and for this, we, um, we uh, account for control for saccade amplitude because a larger saccade we would expect to have a longer duration. So, um, so after accounting for saccade amplitude, we found that the duration of saccades was reduced in individuals with autism across both 12 and 24 degree targets. Um, and this was true in their parents as well. So parents of individuals with autism were also um, exhibiting saccades that had shorter durations. And then we also found that individuals with autism were showing um, saccades with uh, higher peak velocity, again, controlling for that saccade amplitude. So here, this is showing that individuals with autism are making faster saccades as well compared to uh, typically developing controls. And again, parents were also showing a similar pattern with significantly faster saccades compared to um, the age match controls. And now looking at um, results from the predictive saccade task. So again, this is the task where um, the target moves back and forth in a very reliable pattern. And here we're looking at how individuals latency, uh, the degree to which it decreases across trials. So what we found when we were looking at individuals with autism compared to their age match controls, we actually found that they had very similar learning rates um, on the early trials. So their latencies decreased, showing that they were learning that pattern and expecting the next target to appear across those early trials um, in a very similar rate. However, we also noticed that um, there was an increase in latency toward the later trials, which may be an indication of a fatigue effect. So participants may, uh, may have been um, getting a little fatigued by the end of this task. And then in parents um, of individuals with autism, we actually found a, a group by direction interaction where parents were showing reduced latency 
compared to controls to leftward targets. And, um, and then the two groups were similar for rightward targets. So this is suggesting that parents actually may have um, shown some increased procedural learning. So they may have learned and reduced their latencies faster than um, their age match controls specifically to leftward targets. Um, and this is um, a finding that actually um, conflicts a little bit with some uh, findings that we found previously looking at um, predictive saccade tasks in autism. So we would have expected that parents would have actually learned slower um, than controls. Um, so indicating longer latencies here. So um, this may, this is just kind of uh, suggesting that some of the performance on this particular task um, is kind of variable across samples. Um, so our data is a little bit um, messier uh, in this task compared to that VGS task or visually guided saccade task. Okay, and then um, for the smooth pursuit task, we found um, a group by age interaction in the individuals with autism compared to controls where um, the individuals with autism um, were showing, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I believe that my uh, crosses are actually mixed up here. Sorry about that. So individuals with autism here are actually in the dotted line where they were showing reduced pursuit gains, so less accurate smooth pursuit when they were um, in the younger ages compared to controls. However, some of those older individuals with autism were actually performing a little bit better than some of the controls. And then in parents, we actually did not find any main effects or interactions um, for that involved group. Um, so the parents and controls performed um, pretty similarly on the smooth pursuit task. Okay, now looking at familiality. So again, here we're looking at how performance across all of these ocular motor tasks was related within individual family trios. So these first two graphs um, are related to performance on the visually guided saccade task. So again, that um, looking at reactive saccades toward a target. And here we found that the velocity of saccades was um, strongly familial. So, oops, I'm sorry. So we are seeing that um, individuals with autism who had faster velocities also had parents who had faster velocities on this task as well. And then we had, there was a similar um, heritability for acceleration. So the acceleration of their saccades on uh, the visually guided saccade task um, were higher for individuals with autism who had parents with uh, higher acceleration as well. And then finally, in the predictive saccade task, we found that performance on this task was familial as well. So um, the rate at which participants learned um, to uh, reduce their latency in expectation of that next target appearing um, actually was familial as well. All right, so what does this mean in terms of the brain? Um, so uh, these, we really found some atypical saccade dynamics, again, in that visually guided saccade task that really implicate some differences in cerebellar brainstem circuits um, because these are highly involved in those rapid reactive sensory motor behaviors. And it also suggests that these differences are also familial. And then thinking about performance on the predictive saccade task, this is really suggesting that areas involving the striatum and cerebellum, which are involved in the timing of responses, may be affected specifically within some families of individuals with autism, because uh, we were seeing that performance on that predictive saccade task was familial. All right. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit to talk about um, some of the cognitive findings um, as well. So um, specifically within the realm of, um, you know, cognitive control or executive function, um, I've been really interested in studying inhibitory control, which is the ability to suppress 
a prepotent or dominant behavioral response. And inhibitory control is really related to um, clinical symptoms as well, such as impulsivity. Um, and we found uh, inhibitory control to be impaired in autism across a variety of different tasks. So things like uh, the go-no-go -no -go task, the stop signal task, which I'll be focusing on today, as well as the anti saccade task. Um, and then we've also found these impairments to be um, present in autism across different response modalities as well. So, um, so this is true whether we're using a manual motor inhibitory control task. Um, so when you're inhibiting making a button press um, as well as ocular motor inhibitory control tasks. So um, inhibiting eye movements. And specifically within individuals with autism, these impairments in inhibitory control are related to more severe restrictive and repetitive behaviors. Um, so this is some uh, data from um, a study of, of MAPS back from 2009, um, showing that individuals who made more errors on um, an inhibitory control task, this was specifically the anti saccade task, we're showing a higher, um, higher scores on the ADI for uh, restricted and repetitive behaviors. And then we've also found that inhibitory control impairments are uh, prevalent in parents of individuals with autism as well. So again, suggesting that this may be another um, important endophenotype because it is heritable. Um, so specifically looking at this middle portion of this graph, this is looking at um, performance on a stop signal task, so um, a task of inhibitory control. And this is showing that both probands or individuals with autism here in the dark gray, as well as their parents in the light gray, were showing uh, impairments on this inhibitory control task compared to controls. And um, again, we um, know a lot about the um, neurophysiology that's involved in these behaviors. So specifically thinking about the inhibition of eye movements or ocular motor inhibition, this really involves um, frontostriatal pathways that include the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, frontal eye field, and caudate nucleus which can be proactively activated in order to inhibit um, activity through the substantia nigra and the superior colliculus. So um, by proactively activating these, activity, these um, areas, we can um, better improve our ability to inhibit um, eye movements. So specifically, um, I'll be talking about um, some data that was actually just recently published um, on an ocular motor inhibitory control task using a stop signal task. So um, in this task, there are go trials and stop trials. And on go trials, um, participants fixate at the center of the screen and then a go cue, which just like the, in the visually guided saccade task is a white circle. Um, and this appears to the left or the right and participants are tasked with just looking at that circle as quickly as possible. So again, these GO trials look very similar to our visually guided saccade task that I was talking about earlier. However, where this task really differs is that um, there are also stop trials which are randomly intermixed amongst the GO trials. And on these stop trials, after this GO cue appears or this white circle, there then appears a stop signal, which is a red stop sign in the middle of the screen. And this indicates that participants should inhibit looking toward the go cue. So they should inhibit making um, that ocular motor response. And because these stop trials are randomly intermixed amongst the go trials, participants don't know on any single trial whether they're going to have to inhibit their um, behavior or not. So this task really allows us to look at um, two different uh, ways that participants can successfully inhibit their behaviors. 
So proactive control is the ability to proactively delay the onset of your responses in order to increase your ability to inhibit those responses. So, um, so in this task, what this looks like is participants increase their reaction time, so they delay their responses on go trials, um, which gives uh, them more time to potentially inhibit their responses if they need to. So it increases their ability to um, inhibit responses on stop trials. And then um, on the other side, participants can also use reactive control, which is this ability to inhibit um, responses really quickly in reaction to the appearance of the stop signal. Um, and in the stop signal task, this is estimated um, by um, estimating the reaction time of this internal stopping process, which is called the stop signal reaction time or the SSRT. Okay, so looking at some of these results um, using this ocular motor stop signal task, with individuals with autism compared to controls, we found that individuals with autism are showing reduced stopping accuracy. So the percent of, trial, of stop trials on which they successfully inhibited is reduced compared to um, typically developing control individuals. And then we also found that individuals with autism showed reduced proactive slowing of their responses. So this measure of go reaction time slowing or the degree to which they're able to use that proactive control strategy was reduced in individuals with autism. So here we're finding that individuals with autism were less able to take on that proactive um, control strategy in order to improve their stopping um, ability. And then we also found that individuals with autism actually had a lower or faster SSRT. Um, so this is that measure of reactive control. So this is suggesting that um, individuals with autism actually had faster reactive control processes, suggesting that they may have had better control, uh, reactive control processes compared to um, their typically developing controls in the study. And then um, looking at how these proactive and reactive control processes really affected their ability to actually inhibit their responses, we found that go reaction time slowing, so again, this measure of proactive control was highly correlated with, the, with their stopping accuracy for both groups. This is, so this is suggesting that individuals who were better able to delay their responses um, so again, able to adopt that proactive control strategy, they were really better able to actually inhibit their responses as well. However, um, this measure of reactive control, the SSRT, was not related to stopping accuracy at all for either group. So this is suggesting that um, the ability to react quickly to the stop signal was actually not very helpful in this task. Um, and that helps explain why, even though individuals with autism are showing um, potentially a little bit better reactive control compared to the typically developing controls, it really wasn't able to help their stopping accuracy. So overall, we're still seeing reduced um, ability to inhibit their responses. And then we also found that performance on this task was related to clinical symptoms um, and specifically to restricted and repetitive behaviors. So what we saw was that increased stopping accuracy, so um, individuals who are better able to inhibit their responses had uh, reduced severity of stereotyped behaviors. So these are things like body rocking and hand flapping um, and then similarly, um, individuals who are better able to adopt this proactive control strategy um, had reduced um, severity of stereotyped behaviors. And then um, individuals who had lower um, go reaction time slowing or um, sorry, better um, proactive control also had reduced um, severity of ritualistic behaviors. So these are things like needing to follow really specific rituals, for example, during meals or needing to take a really specific route to school. 
Um, so overall, we're finding what we expected with relationships um, where um, better performance on this task meant less severe symptoms, or again, um, having impairments in inhibitory control or worse performance on this task was related to more severe symptoms of restricted and repetitive behaviors. However, we only found this to be true in one of the two samples. Um, so this data for this paper was collected at uh, two different locations. And we only found these relationships to be true for participants where the data was collected at one of our two locations. So this is suggesting um, that we're not really capturing the entire story here. So um, restricted and repetitive behaviors, like a lot of um, clinical symptoms, are really multidimensional, complex behaviors that um, reflect multiple mechanisms. Um, and so we're really only able to predict a small part of this variance when we're looking at specifically inhibitory control. So while we think that these really are related, um, there's um, variability here because, um, because of the uh, complexity of these behaviors. So for example, we have um, another individual in our lab, Catherine Unruh, who is trying to parse this apart a little bit more by looking at um, how these cognitive impairments may interact with other processes like reward processing in order to affect um, these more complex behaviors. All right, and then um, looking at these results in terms of what this means for the brain in individuals with autism. So again, looking at these frontostriatal circuits that are very important for um, inhibiting ocular motor responses, um, this reduced proactive control in autism is really suggesting that individuals with autism are less able to proactively activate this top-down control from frontal cortex through the striatum in order to um, proactively um, inhibit those saccades. All right, and then briefly, I wanna talk a little bit about um, what um, I'm hoping to do in the future. So um, I'm hoping for my dissertation to um, be able to really clarify these neurophysiological processes that are associated with inhibitory control. So even though um, we were able to make uh, really specific, um, we're able to draw these really specific implications from um, our behavioral results, uh, we next really want to um, nail down or clarify some of those neurophysiological processes that may be in, involved in these impairments. So specifically, I'm hoping to combine both fMRI and um, EEG um, with um, ERP analyses in, in particular or event-related potential um, while participants are completing a stop signal task. So this would help us both localize through fMRI as well um, as define the temporal dynamics through that EEG and ERP um, analyses of these brain networks that are really involved in inhibitory control issues in autism. And we hope that this line of research will support more targeted interventions and effect, more effective clinical trials in autism. Um, first of all, by providing more precise, objective, and biologically linked outcome measures um, that can be very useful for clinical trials in order to assess um, target engagement, as well as reliably track treatment-related changes um, throughout uh, across time in clinical trials. So unfortunately, um, this research has been put on hold um, because of coronavirus. However, right before our lab um, you know, shut down to in-person testing because of coronavirus, I was able to collect some initial EEG data on one participant. Um, so I'm gonna show you some of that data really quickly. Um, so here um, are some ERP results, um, again, from that one individual who completed a stop signal task. Um, and for those who are less familiar, famil familiar sorry, with um, ERP analyses, um, this is really looking at brain activity immediately following a particular stimulus. Um, so on these graphs here, 
On the x-axis, um, this is showing time in milliseconds. So as you can see um, in our two um, graphs here, we're really looking at um, brain activity in less than a second for about a half a second after the appearance of a particular stimulus. And in the stop signal task, we're really interested in two different stimuli. So both the go cue, which is that um, in the task I described before is that white circle that tells you to respond, as well as the stop signal um, is the other, that's the other um, stimulus that we're really interested in. So that um, signal that tells you to inhibit your responses. So what we're finding in this very preliminary um, data is um, that when we compare brain activity um, in response to the go cue in this upper graph and then in response to the stop signal in the lower graph, um, so when we're comparing activity on correct compared to incorrect stop trials. So here in the black, you're seeing correct stop trials. So um, this participant was able to successfully inhibit and then in the red is when they failed to inhibit. So they made um, that response instead of inhibiting. And so here we're seeing that um, successful inhibition is related to a decreased um, uh, amplitude here in a component that occurs pretty early on. This is called the N1. And this is, um, was found particularly in um, an, occipital, an occipital region here, which is um, so at the posterior of the brain over occipital lobes. So this is suggesting that um, when this participant was successful, there was reduced initial visual processing of the SCOQ. So that may suggest that there was <clears throat> reduced attention to that GOQ. Um, and a reduced initial reaction, which supported their ability to inhibit their response to the GOQ. And then also um, on stop signals. Um, so in response to the stop signal, we found that there is a difference in this um, later component. It's called the P3. And this is really indicative of um, higher, uh, uh, yeah, higher order processing of the stop signal. And when the participant was successful, this component was both earlier and larger. So this is suggesting that um, increased um, and faster, higher order processing of the stop signal um, is supporting um, successful stopping. And specifically, this was found in um, frontocentral region. So here um, toward the over uh, frontal cortex, which is um, again, uh, part of that frontal striatal circuit that we would expect um, is really important in um, inhibiting saccades. So when that area is, um, is processing the stop cue um, earlier and to a greater degree, the participant is better able to inhibit. So again, um, these are just very initial results, um, but there will be hopefully more of this um, to come. All right. So I wanted to just quickly thank um, everyone in my lab, um, many of whom have been very closely involved in a lot of these projects. Um, and uh, those who have not have also helped um, support me um, a lot of the time. So um, I'll conclude my talk with that and take any questions. Thanks so much, Shannon. Um, you got through a lot of data in that talk, so thanks for walking us through that. Um, so people can uh, either send questions via the, the chat box um, or unmute themselves um, and let Shannon know what questions you have. Hi, Shannon, great presentation. Um, I was wondering if for the ERP data that you're looking at, are you planning on looking at the air related negativity or feedback related negativity as well? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, that um, is not something that is a primary um, interest of ours, but it, it certainly may be something that we kind of look at more as secondary analyses, um, but so the error-related negativity would be, um, 
as you know, would be more in looking at whether they or how they're responding to when they have performed incorrectly, right? Um, so, um, so uh, we're more interested in looking at some of these um, processes that happen um, proactively. So again, before even the appearance of the stop signal, um, because we found that that is uh, is what's really driving these inhibitory control impairments. So, um, so we're looking at at um, some of these reactions to the GoQ in particular to really capitalize on, on activity that's happening even before the appearance of the stop signal because we think that's really what's going to be key in individuals with autism. Yeah, I just noticed that on the bottom graph there, you did have that deflection around 250 milliseconds that looked very similar to like a feedback related negativity. Um, so it just stood out to me since it was over FZ. So. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, it's hard with EEG data, there's just so much information there, there's so many possible things to look at, but I think that's a really good point um, of something something interesting to look into. So yeah, thank you. Hi Shannon, this is Becca. Really nice presentation. Um, it's really interesting. I have a question about early stuff that you, you presented back to the familial um, uh, links. Okay. In one of the, I don't remember which one it was, but in one of the, um, the measures you were showing an age effect and you showed mm -hmm. um, the difference at, at younger ages, but not in the parents. And I'm wondering how, um, if you have any other ways to connect that familial link, if there is an age effect, does that make sense? What I'm asking? Connect the familial. Can so if the, if the age effect, yeah. So if there is a, if there is a, this effect here that you're showing, um, that as individuals get older, the difference between the groups goes away then presumably when you're looking at the parents, you won't, they're already in that um, phase where there is no difference between the groups. So yeah. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how to, how to get around that. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, especially because, I mean, you're right that we didn't find um, any group effects in the parents. Um, so that the hypothesis is kind of, would kind of make sense. Um, I would be a little bit um, cautious, I guess, um, really interpreting this higher end of this graph. And, and I didn't, um, just in the interest of time, I didn't go into this in detail, but we did have fewer participants with autism here um, in this higher end of the graph. So um, I think we feel a little less confident that, um, that this is really a trend rather than, um, them kind of leveling off and more just getting closer um, to the controls. But I think you're right that that um, is kind of a helpful way of thinking about why we didn't find um, these effects in the, the adults, because maybe um, it's something that's really only um, noticeable early on. But then again, uh, it, it does kind of contradict with some of um, the earlier findings. Um, so findings that we found in previous studies where um, gain, uh, so this smooth pursuit gain um, was uh, impaired in the in family members of individuals with autism as well. So um, I think that this is, again, just something that um, varies a little bit by sample. Um, and it's possible that, we are seeing um, a, a greater impact here in individuals with autism than um, in their family members. So, so it certainly may be something that's um, more noticeable when they're younger, a larger impact. So yeah, that's a good point. I will add that this is, just, oh, go ahead, Beck. It looks like you might have follow-up. Yeah, just to follow up on that, um, you also mentioned that there's a possibility of looking at familiar Familiality. Familiality, yeah. <laughs> in uh, um, siblings. So I'm wondering yeah. if you would, if you have a sibling data set that you might see the difference. <laughs> we, 
We don't really have enough siblings in our current data set to look at that. Um, some of the previous uh, studies that um, Matt and others have done included siblings um, with the parents um, in the analysis. So I don't know, Matt, if you can speak to whether there are any differences there, but we don't have enough siblings, unfortunately, in our sample to look at that separately. We had more siblings in that original data set um, to look at this, but not really sufficient to determine whether there were age effects or whether it was um, whether these issues were, were more profound in, in siblings as opposed to parents. It would be an important study to do. Um, what I was going to say before, and it relates to this point, is that you know we um, we oftentimes talk about heterogeneity within autism, rightfully so. And I mean, it's, it's sort of one of the major challenges across different psychiatric developmental disorders is how do you parse this? And, um, and, and these family study, studies are one attempt to do that because um, you, know, you do start seeing some of this stuff segregate in, in particular families. And that's what these familiality um, estimates help us do or help us derive. It helps to inform also you know, family genetic studies where you're gonna have people who are bad at making saccades, they're less accurate at making saccades, and that seems to be familiar. That's something you can look at in, in, in larger samples of families. And, but, you know, this was a, um, for people that have done family studies before, whether it's autism or other disease, um, you know, it's somewhat of a, it's a real challenge. It, it, it takes a lot of work to find these family trios and then to get everybody in um, and, and, and to get the data. And, and frankly, so it was, it was, a, it was um, significant time and, and, and resources to, to study whatever is a hundred some families in this particular study. But, but some of the adult psychiatric, uh, adult psychiatry work is, is showing us that we need really like sort of thousands of families, you know, and, and that's, uh, you know, so there, there, there's some nice convergence in these two independent data sets and what Shan has presented and what had been done previously, um, you know, and so that's exciting and that's something you can build on, but, but there's also some inconsistencies, frankly, and we see this in the autism literature generally, but, but, but it, there's the family data, I would imagine would be even more so because the effects are a little bit uh, more subtle, less, you know, that they're, they're more mild. Um, and, and then you, you're, you're, you're having to find, um, um, the families for whom this is present and, and familial and, and then, and then, and then determine that effect. So, yeah, so frankly, there is some inconsistency there. And it's a little hard to figure out the pre uh, predictive saga or procedural learning test in particular, just seems to sort of, we, we continue to find stuff in the family, in, in the parents, um, these, both of these data sets, but then also multiple independent samples of individuals with autism. But the findings kind of switch in terms of what side they're on and, and who they affect. And so fleshing that out is, is it's, I, I hate saying this, but it, it is just going to require really beefing up the samples and somebody going at this like at an R1 or multi-center type of study. Um, that, that's really the most appropriate way to do this. Again, as the schizophrenia and the bipolar world um, uh, research fields have, have shown us, that's, that's probably what it's going to take to sort of pull that together. I have a question. Great presentation. I was wondering if this type of uh, relationship or um, has been studied or seen in other uh, neurodevelopmental disorders or in another word, is it specific in autism or uh, could be seen in other um, uh, neurodevelopmental conditions too? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so at least what I know of, um, the ocular motor control impairments um, are very prominent in schizophrenia research primarily. Um, and we actually, um, I believe, um, see that it's heritable within schizophrenia as well. Um, the things that I looked at later on, so the inhibitory control impairments that I was talking about with things like the stop signal task, these were actually originally developed for um, ADHD research. Um, so I mentioned that uh, performance on tasks like this are very closely related to um, symptoms like impulsivity. Um, and so the autism literature kind of stole these things from ADHD research where they find impairments on uh, these types of tasks there as well. I would note that um, also, Shane, you and I have talked about this, but the actual, the 
the nature of that problem um, in, in terms of the inhibitory yeah. control issues seems to be a little bit different in autism and ADHD, which is actually one of the exciting pieces to it. So in other words, we see, as, as, as Shannon eloquently described, that there's this failure to, to delay response onset. So there's this preparatory problem that we see in autism that really drives their failure to, to stop the behavior, to terminate or interrupt it. Um, and, and that preparatory control seems to be the mechanism, um, at least based on a correlational analysis for autism. In ADHD, that's not necessarily the case. In ADHD, we see more of a problem with the stop signal reaction time or that reactive control, how quickly they can interrupt uh, a, a, a behavior that they've initiated. All right, I saw you go back to unmute, Zora. So I didn't know whether you had something. Oh, no, I just wanted to say that um, I, I kind of know the answer to my question that um, uh, it would be nice if you could uh, recruit more participants for this study and I'll look for differences between gender because um, I think that is another interesting angle to, to, to be explored whether or not you would find differences in males and females and also correlate that back to even uh, uh, paternal or maternal uh, relationship with the parents because um, which obviously requires a larger sample size as Matt um, said. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, you know, unfortunately, that's always a challenge with autism research because it's so much more prevalent in males compared to females. So it's, it's difficult to get um, well matched samples. Um, however, uh, in our family study, we actually did um, have a pretty good number of um, mothers and fathers. Um, and so it's, when we're looking at those family trios, we actually can kind of piece apart some of um, what may be um, coming from a maternal versus um, a paternal lineage. Um, but those, some of those analyses are still kind of to come. <laughs> mm -hmm. Interesting. That may be a good point to, to discuss further, Zora. Um, offline as, as we pull this um, this data together to its final stages, it, um, I'd be happy to share it with you. Maybe we can talk about some of those maternal versus paternal effects. Um, definitely, yeah, definitely happy to do. I see we are at time though. Um, so I wanna thank everyone for, uh, for joining us for um, throughout the semester for these seminars, but in particular for um, for today, Shannon, again, wonderful job with, um, with a lot of data. Um, I, I'm biased, but it's really interesting data. Um, so, um, but thanks for walking us through it. Thanks everyone for staying with us. Um, now back to CNN or NPR, wherever you get your news. Um, but stay sane, everyone. Stay healthy. Good seeing y'all. Um, take care. Mm -mm.